Hi everyone, today's lecture is dedicated to emotion. Um, and this is a bit of a newer topic in the context of um, cognitive um, neuroscience um, for many researchers. Um, so for instance, previous um, versions of the textbook did not necessarily uh, pay that much attention to um, emotion. And many researchers in the field um, have not necessarily acknowledged the role of uh, emotion in the context of cognition. In the interest of full disclosure, I used to be one of those researchers who consider that um, emotion is rather a nuisance or a source of noise when you're interested in finding out the um, um, neural correlates of, let's say, visual perception or memory or decision making. However, that um, prejudice and misconception about um, emotion has been corrected um, in uh, more recent years. And um, it is certainly the case that nowadays uh, emotion has become a, uh, an important topic of research in cognitive neuroscience. And it has been shown to influence a lot of cognitive processes. Um, from memory and decision making to um, vision and auditory processing. Um, so as intuitive as um, that might seem to you and as obvious, um, it has certainly been a major step in um, taking a take full um, in attempting to take full stock of the influence um, and the relevance of um, emotion um, for uh, cognition. The uh, objectives of the lecture for today um, accordingly contain a number of items, such as understanding the complexity of what constitutes um, an emotion. And um, this also feeds into one of the reasons why emotion has had such a bad rep over the years. There's quite a bit of disagreement about what emotion is, um, how it should be defined, and what is uh, the mechanism of um, emotion relative to uh, different parts of cognition and even to physiological processes. So it is important to understand of why um, and how um, emotion has moved from a um, controversial topic um, and one with a relatively bad reputation to something uh, which has uh, more recently come into the limelight. Then we will look at how the amygdala supports the bridging between emotions and memory acquisition. And this certainly makes sense. Whenever people talk about um, um, emotion, uh, probably the uh, cortical structure that is most often discussed is the amygdala. So uh, we should certainly look at it, but not just the amygdala. Uh, another important uh, part of the cortex, uh, which is um, relevant for um, emotion-driven behavior is the orbitofrontal cortex. And we'll look at the classic case of Phineas Gage um, that uh, most students in um, neuroscience um, are familiar with. We will look at how um, um, cognitive uh, control of emotions is um, informed by um, using uh, fMRI in uh, healthy controls. And all that also illustrates the, the value of um, studying healthy individuals and not just basing our theory of emotion on um, neuropsychological cases. Then we will look at a number of um, games or problems such as the Iowa gambling task, the trolley problem and the ultimatum game and see how they uh, contribute in a complementary manner to how we understand um, emotion, its role in decision making um, and also um, differences um, resulting from um, uh, different types of um, uh, cortical damage. Uh, last but not least, we will look at the discussion section of a uh, journal um, article and we'll see what the anatomy of this section might look like and how we should best approach it. The study of emotion is fraught with uh, plenty of controversy and um, disputes and disagreements, perhaps much more so than any of the other um, components of cognition that we have discussed so far in the course, attention, memory, vision. 
And um, your textbook certainly makes that abundantly clear by um, briefly listing or summarizing a variety of theories of, uh, of emotion and pointing out um, in what respects they are different from each other. But perhaps you were surprised to find out that um, there's quite a bit of, the, uh, of disagreement even on how researchers define emotion, um, whether in um, cognitive psychology or um, cognitive neuroscience or um, anthropology. Um, there is an entire list of possible definitions of uh, emotion, such as a valence experience with a particular pattern of physiological activity, or a mental and physiological state associated with a wide variety of feelings, thoughts and behaviors. And the list can go on and on and on. However, if you try to look at an entire set of such definitions, what uh, tends to occur quite uh, um, often in uh, all those different definitions are components such as subjective reports or feelings along with physiological and behavioral responses and also cognitive appraisal. Now what does that mean? Well, um, certainly subjective reports um, which we label as feelings are quite common when we talk about um, emotion. Certainly um, um, literature is full of them and so is colloquial talk. We, uh, we feel afraid, we feel happy, we feel bored, we feel calm. Um, and this is all subjective. This is based on a subjective evaluation and description of our own internal states. But along with such reports, we are also aware of physiological changes. For instance, some emotions can induce a, uh, a change in your heart rate. Your heart rate can go up. Um, it can involve um, sweating. Um, it can involve a raise or a decrease um, in your body temperature. So these are physiological um, changes induced or related to uh, emotion um, that we certainly have plenty of uh, awareness um, and intuition about. Also, um, some emotions um, tend to be associated with um, stereotypical behavioral responses. For instance, fear may be related to flight, to running away from the object of, uh, of your fear. Now, uh, one other component that occurs quite often is labeled as cognitive appraisal. Uh, we certainly interpret our emotions or the cause of our emotions. Um, and one example of such cognitive appraisal is um, by um, relationship to the ratio between harm and benefit um, involved in, uh, in the cause or the content of one emotion. Okay, so just a few components, but plenty of disagreement in how um, different theories relay these components to each other, both um, in terms of causality and also in terms of temporal um, sequencing, as well as in relative importance uh, when approaching um, emotion, either from a psychological or a neuroscience um, standpoint. So if the definition of emotion is so contentious, uh, perhaps we can find more, um, more common ground by investigating the gallery of human uh, emotions. We certainly, most of us at least, have experienced um, a range of emotions such as um, excitement, happiness, um, but also anger um, and fear and sadness and calm and so on and so forth. So once we have an understanding of all this gallery of, uh, of emotions and how they relate to each other, perhaps we can find some common ground for um, our research of emotion. However, even here there is plenty of, uh, of disagreement. Um, and a major source of disagreement is in terms of how we should approach emotion, whether in a categorical fashion or um, in a more continuous fashion. For instance, are emotions just um, a list of, um, of different states, a set of different states, which, uh, some of which I have um, already uh, mentioned? 
or rather we can think of emotion as an entire space, a continuum within which this um, different emotions are um, rather fuzzy areas with um, fuzzy borders between each other, uh, allowing many different combinations and allowing many emotions that perhaps don't have a uh, clear-cut name within, uh, within a given culture or a language. So then the question would be, how do we organize these emotions within a space? And one of the best uh, well-known um, spaces of human emotion relies on a distinction between negative valence and positive valence, as well as between low arousal and high arousal. So if we think about an emotional space organized across these two axes, then we can certainly place um, emotions like um, happiness um, and delight in the positive uh, on the positive side while things like um, anger and um, sadness on the negative side and um, if we are thinking about the arousal um, dimension which corresponds to the intensity of an emotion then we may have things such as um, sadness um, and tiredness um, and calm uh, on the low end while things like um, astonishment um, and fear may be at the uh, higher arousal um, end of that spectrum. So then um, how should we think about emotion? Just categories, um, distinct uh, points um, in this um, space that uh, characterizes emotions rather than provides them with the uh, uh, with a contentful uh, meaning or rather we should think as um, as this emotion simply as things that have a correlate a uh, an analog in our language but um, otherwise they simply list uh, a number of regions in a much uh, more complex space whose main dimensions are arousal and valence so um, those are, this is just an example of controversy that has shaped um, our um, understanding um, of emotion and research um, in the field. And uh, many researchers have tried to um, come up with, uh, with a way to bring more um, coherence to the study of emotion and to cultivate agreement uh, amongst fellow researchers. And perhaps none is as famous in the study of emotion as Paul Ekman. Um, his contribution to the field is widely recognized as the attempt to identify primary emotions, fundamental emotions that cut across cultures and in that manner um, argue for an innate component of, uh, of emotion and doing so upon examination of facial emotional expressions. What um, Ekman did um, is evaluate um, the structure of facial um, expressions across many individuals, across many different cultures, and identifying the main emotions that tend to occur or be expressed by such uh, um, facial um, expressions um, in a wide variety of um, individuals and cultures and across different points in time. And he came up with six fundamental emotions, universal emotions, anger, fear, disgust, surprise, happiness, and sadness. Um, and the way in which he described them is by introducing what he called the facial action coding system, or FACS, um, and that refers to a specific pattern of um, activation of musculature of, um, of the face. Um, and we're not going to go into details as to the different muscles uh, of the face, the different names, um, and um, the specific relation to different um, emotions. But we all have an, uh, an intuition and um, some basic understanding of how this musculature facilitates the expression of, uh, of emotion. So, for instance, whenever you feel happy, you tend to, to smile, which means that the corners of your your mouth will, uh, will tend to come apart. And there are specific muscles of the face that allow you to do that. Well, if you feel uh, fear, your, um, your eyes tend to, to be wide open. And there are plenty of theories as to why that might happen. For instance, uh, facilitating um, a, 
a wider range of uh, visual input so you can take in and uh, and um, um, evaluate the um, current um, set of circumstances um, and facilitate an adequate reaction. And also when, um, when you feel uh, disgusted, uh, you may squint your eyes. So again, uh, muscles around your eyes um, and uh, eyebrows can, um, can change the way in which um, the, the face can um, um, express different um, emotions. Does that mean that people tend to agree with uh, with this theory, or that even that uh, we have fundamental emotions, uh, universal, and there are six? No, um, not in the least. There are plenty of theorists um, that argue that um, um, there are no universal emotions, or that there are more universal emotions, or perhaps fewer. So um, debates certainly uh, abound in the uh, in the field, but um, this doesn't mean to say that Paul Exman's contribution uh, has not been uh, quite seminal and widely acknowledged. Um, and this also illustrates how important um, the study of uh, of face um, structure and face uh, expression has been in the in the study of um, emotion. However. Um, since this is a course in cognitive neuroscience, not just psychology or um, anthropology, um, what can we say about the neural basis of emotion? And for the, for the um, largest part, uh, we will focus on a number of regions uh, which are of interest um, in the study of emotion. But what we should be keeping in mind is that emotion, just like memory, just like attention, just like vision, is not facilitated by one brain area. Instead, it relies on an entire network um, or perhaps even on a network of different networks of different neural circuits. And some of those um, areas um, are listed here or shown, color-coded. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that we should be aware of all these regions for the purpose of the exam. This is just an illustration. Um, and it is a cautionary note that while um, uh, over the next few slides we will pause and um, try to debate or uncover or summarize what people might be thinking about the contribution of one region or another to um, how we experience and process emotions. That doesn't mean to say that emotions are limited um, in their functioning to the, um, to the neural processing carried out at the level of um, just a limited number of um, cortical and subcortical areas. We um, simply pause on a limited number of regions and um, uh, brain structures, uh, both because of their prominence in the field um, and also because of the abundance of evidence that uh, we have to date uh, about their role in um, processing emotion. Now, an interesting way to approach emotion and its um, neural basis is to ask about its functionality, its role. And uh, certainly there are plenty of theories about the value of emotion in social settings. Um, if you see someone likely to be sad, you may, uh, you may be better off um, not expressing intense feelings of happiness, of self-satisfaction because let's say you aced an exam. Or if you see someone uh, really angry, you might avoid news um, pieces of information are likely to lead to a potential conflict um, at the time. However, emotion has also been um, related quite often with uh, cognition, especially with, uh, with memory. And one um, theory that has been um, extensively studied in the field is the possibility that emotion might boost memorability. Now, as uh, we briefly um, discussed last time, this is not necessarily correct. At least as, as far as flashbulb memories are concerned, the feeling of um, recollection does not necessarily translate into higher accuracy of, uh, of recollection of memories for things with um, emotional content. But what about the neural basis 
of uh, memories with emotional content versus memories with less uh, potent emotional content. And here is an example of such a study in which uh, participants viewed pictures um, of scenes with a neutral emotional content, let's say just a picture of a room, versus um, pictures um, that are likely to induce an emotional reaction, let's say someone in a hospital bed. So um, what participants did in the studies is look at an entire series of such, um, such images, um, either with emotional or non-emotional um, content, and then they um, underwent a um, incidental memory test while their brains uh, were scanned using um, fMRI. And uh, what they had to do um, in this test um, is evaluate whether they have seen or not images. So they were presented both with the old images uh, and also with new ones, with, with foils. So they had to decide whether something was viewed prior to the fMRI experience or um, experiment or not. Um, but in addition to that, also to um, mention whether um, those images that they did um, um, label as old, as previously seen, were remembered in vivid detail uh, with a lot of contextual information as to, let's say, the, the thoughts that came to mind when the picture was um, initially presented, the amount of detail, and so on and so forth, whether they were simply familiar with those uh, images. They recall those images, but without all, um, all the uh, detail that would um, accompany a, uh, a vivid sense of uh, remembering. So again, someone can be accurate um, in their judgments, but they might be different to how many items they remember with detail, or just know without a whole lot of uh, detail and with a, a much uh, lower sense of, uh, of vividness. And um, the others replicated some uh, previous behavioral results uh, by showing that accuracy um, indeed was not different between items with um, neutral versus um, high emotional content. However, uh, in terms of remembering versus knowing, there was an obvious um, difference um, in that um, emotional items uh, were more likely than uh, neutral items to elicit a remember response. And in contrast, neutral items more, more likely to elicit a no response um, relative to emotional items. Um, okay, so if this is the case, then perhaps um, memory for um, items with high uh, emotional content uh, might rely on uh, um, a different um, neural circuit. And to answer that question, the authors focused, um, as you might expect, on the amygdala. Amygdala has long been known for its role in the processing of human um, emotions. Um, and uh, many studies uh, focus uh, either on amygdala in, uh, in isolation or on an entire range of cortical and subcortical areas that uh, by necessity also have to include the amygdala. And uh, what they have found is that, interestingly enough, the activation of the amygdala was uh, maximized uh, for items um, with um, high emotional content that participants um, seem to remember, to recall in vivid um, detail. In contrast, it seemed that um, activation was maximized for neutral uh, items um, that were also remembered in an uh, um, area of the parahippocampal cortex, uh, which is responsible for primarily for uh, uh, perceptual analysis, um, interpretation, and recognition. So um, to that um, end, it seems that um, our brains rely on different cortical um, circuits and on different um, 
uh, brain areas uh, for processing emotional items versus neutral items. For emotional items, we involve the amygdala, uh, which um, underscores the, um, the emotional value of an item, probably as related to arousal, while for neutral items, we tend to probably rely a bit more on sensory processing in um, high-level visual cortex. So again, um, this does not mean that uh, one system provides a uh, better, more accurate um, analysis or a better memorability for some items versus others. Um, it simply shows that um, our brain has different strategies and different um, neural circuits that may overlap, but by and large um, are not identical when dealing with high versus low emotional content. Now, this study looked at emotional versus non-emotional stimuli generally, but it is well known that amygdala plays a special role in, uh, in the processing of um, fear. And uh, one specific paradigm which is relevant here relies on what we call fear conditioning. And this is just one version of a much more general um, approach, a much more general paradigm, the Pavlovian uh, conditioning, which is uh, well known in uh, behavioral um, neuroscience and um, animal psychology. And it is probably something that you already encountered in um, your intro to psych um, course. Um, the version of conditioning, which is relevant for us, fear conditioning, relies on the association between an otherwise harmless stimulus, let's say um, a light bulb being turned on, with something which um, elicits a fear response, an, um, an innate fear response, such as a shock. So um, in a typical experiment, um, a rat is uh, learned to associate, let's say, um, a light being turned on with a um, um, shock following um, relatively quickly that um, light um, stimulation. Um, and what happens after a while is that not only the shock in itself um, elicits a, um, a normal startle, um, indicative of fear, but also the light that precedes the shock um, begins to elicit that uh, normal um, startle. Um, and clearly we can further potentiate that um, reaction from the part of the animal by um, including additional um, distressing um, signals such as a loud noise that um, accompanies um, the light stimulation and, uh, and the shock. Um, how is this relevant for the study of emotion in, um, in humans? Well, uh, the idea of using um, a uh, pairing of an uh, otherwise harmless stimulus, such as, um, let's say, looking at a um, blue square on a computer screen with a subsequent um, small but predictable electric shock as applied to, let's say, um, your hand, your wrist, or your fingers. Um, this is um, indeed quite effective. So um, over a short period of time and a relatively small number of trials, um, humans can learn to associate um, and to respond with fear um, as a reaction to the uh, conditioned stimulus, the, the blue um, um, square. Um, and in the context of a neuroscience investigation, what we might predict is that the amygdala will be much more active um, in response to a blue square which has become a conditioned stimulus, a stimulus that predicts an incoming uh, shock, um, versus a um, harmless blue um, square which is not um, associated with, um, with such a response because uh, the conditioning training has not taken place yet, let's say. Um, Furthermore, what we find in such experiments is that there is a uh, significant positive correlation between the amount of uh, amygdala um, activation um, and the skin conductance response. 
This is essentially a um, physiological index of uh, arousal, which largely depends on the amount of momentary sweating, um, typically um, in response to a uh, stimulus. So um, the more fearful you are in response to a stimulus, um, the more activity we see in the amygdala and also um, the, the more you tend to sweat and um, the higher the resulting um, change in uh, skin conductance. Okay, but this is a relatively simple um, experiment in design. How is this relevant for real world fear? Well, if we talk about fear in real world um, circumstances, perhaps one of the best uh, known and certainly one of uh, the most common, especially in North America, is that of public speaking. The anticipation of public speaking can elicit fear and anxiety. Uh, whether that's because of some prior experience that uh, you might have had or because um, you have seen somebody stumble and feel embarrassed or uncomfortable uh, giving a talk or a presentation or because somebody else um, shared an account of such an experience with you. So irrespective of how um, that learning occurred um, in the first place, um, any kind of stimulus that may um, harbinger the uh, possibility of um, of public speaking would elicit fear. However, this is a much more complex um, scenario and um, to that end, um, in the interest of simplicity and the interest of better control, a lot of what we know about fear in um, uh, lab settings rely on simpler associations and simpler stimuli, whether conditioned stimulus such as the appearance of a blue square on a computer screen or the um, unconditioned stimulus in this case a um, mild electric shock yet this type of studies do have a major limitation and um, that refers to the fact that what we're looking at here is just correlational in nature we see a correlation between amygdala activation and um, the skin conductance um, response uh, between the um, statement or uh, description of fear and uh, amygdala activation. But how do we know um, that this is also causal in relationship? And um, to answer that question, a lot of studies have focused on uh, the pattern of um, fear responses in individuals with uh, amygdala damage. So irrespective of how this occurred, whether let's say due to a stroke or due to a disease that resulted in an atrophy of the uh, amygdala bilaterally or on, on, uh, in a single hemisphere or whether, um, and this is probably um, just as common um, as a result of removing the medial temporal lobe um, in the uh, attempt to treat an intractable um, case of epilepsy, um, which results in the elimination, the um, resection of the amygdala. So irrespective of uh, how the amygdala was lesioned or damaged, um, it is interesting to see the impact of fear conditioning um, in individuals um, who have suffered from such uh, lesions. Uh, and the cartoon shown here uh, illustrates um, a, rather, a rather interesting point. Um, that being the fact that in response to a conditioned stimulus, let's stick to the uh, blue square per uh, our previous um, example, um, while a normal control participant shows a normal, uh, um, typical increase in um, SCR, um, the similar uh, pattern of uh, increase in uh, skin conductance is not seen in patients with amygdala damage. Um, and the reason this is interesting is because the unconditioned stimulus tends to elicit an increase in skin conductance response both in uh, control participants and in patients with uh, amygdala damage. And the interpretation of this finding 
um, would claim that um, this deficit, the deficit associated with an amygdala lesion, is a learning deficit um, regarding emotion rather than a deficit in processing emotion per se. Um, and if we look at a more realistic uh, graph um, from an actual um, experiment rather than a cartoon, we certainly see this uh, pattern of um, result over and over again. So here we see the uh, difference in um, um, SCR in a uh, control um, in controlled participants versus um, individuals with a temporal lobectomy uh, over a number of um, acquisition um, sessions. And indeed, um, in the presence of a conditioned stimulus, um, control participants show that increase while um, patients with temporal lobectomy, which also results in the elimination or the resection of the amygdala, fail to show the corresponding increase. Okay, so what we've uh, learned so far is that um, amygdala is crucial in um, our ability to handle um, emotional memories as well as in emotion-based learning. What about emotion regulation? And this is a topic of considerable theoretical and practical um, significance. Um, how do you rein in um, your emotions, let's say, uh, right before giving a talk, a presentation in front of the class? And how do you do it if you just got a piece of really bad news? And we already know that um, there's quite a bit of variability in our ability to regulate our uh, emotions. Some are much better than others, and also there are circumstances that can make us a lot less efficient in regulating um, our emotions. Um, and from a neuroscience standpoint, of course, one of the most natural questions is what part of the brain is fundamental to emotion regulation? Is it the amygdala? Well, the amygdala might have something to do with it, uh, but in terms of controlling uh, different aspects of behavior, uh, a good candidate would be related to a portion of the frontal, uh, or rather the prefrontal cortex. Since we know that the um, prefrontal cortex is um, uh, fundamental uh, as a providing the mechanisms to control a variety of cognitive functions such as uh, attention, memory, so perhaps emotion as well. Um, and then what we can proceed to do is to look at the uh, connectivity, the anatomical connectivity of the amygdala with parts of the prefrontal cortex. Upon inspection, what we find is that the amygdala has a privileged relationship with um, the orbitofrontal cortex. This is the most anterior part of the prefrontal cortex, lying above um, and slightly behind um, your eyes, hence aptly called orbitofrontal cortex um, or um, OFC. Um, this area is also known as um, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and uh, much of the attention that it received over the years um, in terms of its um, connection to emotion regulation traces back to a uh, classical, to a famous case in uh, neurology. This is the case of Phineas Gage. Uh, and perhaps many of you have already encountered this, um, but if not, um, the short story of uh, this um, accident and this incident um, runs as follows. Uh, Phineas Gage was a railroad worker in uh, 1848. He was a foreman. Um, and in one unfortunate um, on one unfortunate day, um, he happened to uh, put together gunpowder in, um, in a hole using a tamping iron. So this is a huge uh, rod, um, very pointed at uh, one, uh, one end. So it looks a bit like a, like a javelin, but much heavier. And it so happened that um, a spark uh, lit up the, the powder, uh, prompting the iron to pass through his skull. So it, uh, it ended right uh, 
uh, under his um, left eye and then it passed through the brain through the skull and the um, the iron ended up landing far behind the phineas gauge and just to uh, take into account um, at least at, uh, at first sight the, the size of the iron you can see here a, a picture of the skull um, and of the uh, of the tamping iron so you can see that he was quite huge um, he was heavy and he was pointed um, okay so what was the extent of the damage well uh, naturally it took out the the left eye but also it passed through the anterior part of the brain as shown here and this happened to be indeed the orbitofrontal cortex or um, also um, you to use a, uh, a different name for it the ventromedial prefrontal cortex critically many other parts of, uh, of the brain responsible let's say for motor control um, or um, uh, uh, for language were left uh, intact. So you can see here color coded the uh, motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, and all of these regions were left relatively intact. What was damaged was the anterior part of the brain along with the eye, and that's shown here as a bright white spot. So this is a reconstructed, a, uh, an inferred. Uh, picture of the anatomy given uh, what is known about the extent and the location of the damage um, and you can see that indeed the primary area of the brain that was affected is the orbitofrontal cortex okay so what happened as a result of this uh, injury and you might think that Phineas Gage probably died on the spot or maybe um, he was left um, unconscious but surprisingly, neither one of those things happened. Um, yes, he was dazed and confused. Um, those were the words um, used at the time to describe his, um, his uh, situation. But he was able to walk three quarters of a mile to the nearest doctor to, to receive treatment, which is quite surprising. Um, and even more surprising is that uh, Dr. Harlow, um, his um, um, treating doctor at the time uh, managed to save his life um, so at the very beginning he removed um, parts of the shrapnel and he removed parts of the uh, skull and even parts of the brain uh, at the location of the um, injury he patched Phineas Gage up and um, surprisingly Phineas Gage made it um, through, um, through the day However, since um, antibiotics were not available at the time, uh, he developed over the next uh, few weeks a, uh, a terrible brain infection. So he nearly lost um, his life because of this. However, again, um, Dr. Harlow was um, uh, quite efficient in treating the, um, the injury by removing and taking care of the um, infection. Um, and um, Phineas Gage ended up, after a long recovery, um, he ended up living for um, almost a decade after his um, injury. And this is quite surprising, right? Um, but what is even more surprising is that this um, provides um, neuroscience and neurology with the first known case of a brain injury that resulted into a... Uh, significant change in uh, personality including the ability to regulate um, emotion and uh, perhaps some of the most um, vivid illustrations and description of um, his um, this change comes from um, his own um, colleagues at the time um, and they mentioned the fact that um, he remembers passing and past events correctly um, as well before as since the injury. Hence, his ability, his uh, memory abilities were relatively um, intact um, after the accident. But intellectual manifestations feeble, being exceedingly capricious and childish, but with a will as um, indomitable as ever, is particularly obstinate will not yield to restraint when it conflicts with his desires. Um, hence, um, Phineas Gage became quite impulsive after the um, accident. So what's important here is the fact that um, he developed traits of character that he was completely devoid of previous to this. 
and um, his employers described his situation and this um, change perhaps even in uh, stronger words. Previous to the accident, they regarded him as the most efficient and capable foreman. Um, and then considered a change in his mind so marked that they could not give him his place again. So he was no longer responsible, he was no longer efficient. Perhaps this is not such surprising after a major brain injury. But he also found that he was fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting uh, but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires. So again, he was impulsive. He wanted to do whatever he wanted, uh, whenever he wanted, because it felt good. Uh, a child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. So here animal passions um, refers to sexual behavior and uh, inappropriateness. And this is quite common uh, after this type of, uh, of injury, as we now know. His mind was radically changed so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer gauge. Um, in other words, a dramatic shift in, um, in personality and um, in behavior. Okay, so based on this, um, it seems that the um, OFC has a tremendous role in regulating emotion and in uh, controlling different aspects of, uh, of personality. But at the same time, um, you might wonder, how is this relevant nowadays? How often do you see a huge um, road pass through somebody's uh, orbital frontal cortex? And while this indeed is rather rare, uh, what is common nowadays is OFC damage um, due to car accidents. For instance, here is an um, example of um, damage to multiple cortical and subcortical areas in an um, individual that suffered from traumatic brain injury, or TBI for short, due to a car accident. And now uh, what you notice here is that the damage is um, quite, um, quite visible here for the um, OFC in both hemispheres. Um, but this damage is also accompanied by um, ACC um, and amygdala damage. Uh, furthermore, um, this uh, patient underwent uh, DTI, which uh, examined the integrity of, uh, of the tracts. Uh, connecting the uh, amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. And what you might be able to see here is the fact that while the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, including the OFC, um, are connected quite densely, um, in this patient, as a result of, uh, of uh, TBI, the connectivity is drastically reduced. So not only are those... Um, um, those areas, those um, cortical and subcortical area are profoundly damaged, but so is the connectivity between them. Um, and in many of these patients, uh, what we notice is what's called disinhibition, uh, an inability to suppress behavior or uh, verbalization. And um, some studies um, estimate that uh, about 30% of TBI patients um, exhibit um, such um, disinhibition. Um, why would this happen? Well, this is a uh, part of the explanation relies on the anatomical location of the um, OFC uh, because of its position um, at the anterior um, tip of, uh, of the brain, then upon heavy impact, let's say because of sudden braking or because of collision, let's say with a different uh, vehicle, what happens is that uh, that part of the cortex um, hits the, the um, internal side of the skull quite heavily resulting in hemorrhage. And then that um, leads to neuronal death and um, also, as a result of uh, impact, we see a shearing uh, movement of the white matter tracts connecting the OFC with different cortical areas, including, for instance, the amygdala. So um, we see um, both um, cortical damage as a result of the hemorrhage and the heavy impact with the skull and also a tearing of the uh, white matter fibers that connect the prefrontal cortex with um, 
both other parts of, uh, of the cortex, different lobes, and with subcortical structures such as the amygdala. Okay, so as a result of such accidents, uh, we notice disinhibition. But if you go a bit more into detail, what are the most typical symptoms associated with OFC dysfunction? Well, we already talked a bit about emotional regulation. And it's quite interesting to, to listen to these patients and um, um, see what they have to say about their ability to control their emotions or rather their inability to control um, emotions. And many of them report that the intensity of their emotions is much higher than previously um, experienced. So for instance, whenever looking at a, at a sad movie, if um, before the accident, they, uh, they would experience quite normally a feeling of um, sadness or melancholy, um, now they would cry um, quite, uh, quite heavily and for an extended period of time. Or um, in the context of a conflict, uh, while before they would be able to, to keep themselves in check, now they would become quite aggressive and even resort to violent behavior. And this has implications also for um, social behavior. Many of these individuals have difficulty holding on to romantic relationships. They have difficulty holding on to a job because just like Phineas Cage, um, they um, stop being reliable. They might prefer engaging in some fun activity as opposed to going into work. They exhibit impaired decision making. So for instance, gambling is, um, is one of the uh, addictions that many such patients tend to engage in. Whenever receiving, uh, receiving a sum of money, they may prefer to, to gamble it um, right away as opposed to, um, let's say, um, set it aside or buy food or pay a debt. Um, they exhibit an uh, impaired theory of mind. So for instance, whenever you engage in conversation with them, they may not let you speak. Or if you try to speak, they might interrupt you right away. They are very self-focused um, and they, uh, they have difficulty uh, putting themselves into somebody else's shoes, so to speak. They exhibit increased impulsivity. They react on a whim uh, without caring so much about the implications. Rationally, they can understand that this is not good, but emotion, uh, momentary emotion, dominates their, uh, their behavior. Um, this also manifests um, itself through what is called orienting response, or to be more precise, increased orienting response. If they see something um, that is potentially of interest to them, let's say um, an object um, in a shop or a store, then that tends to capture their attention right away at the, uh, at the expense of something else. And they may go ahead and buy that object or item irrespective of cost because decision making is also um, impaired. If they um, see somebody in their environment or in a setting whom they perceive as attractive, that tends to capture, um, that person tends to capture their attention right away. Um, and um, this is also something that Phineas Gage was, uh, was known for. Um, that person may become the target of um, sexually inappropriate um, behavior in even harassment. And this is just, um, an incomplete but um, representative list of symptoms that often accompany um, OFC dysfunction. Thus, we've learned quite a bit about um, emotion regulation and its neural basis by studying patients um, in um, neuropsychology, in um, neurology, However, I do not wish to create the impression that uh, we only know about emotion regulation by studying patients and uh, brain lesions. We know quite a bit about emotion regulation also in normal, healthy adults. And um, neuroimaging, in particular fMRI, has been crucial to um, uh, figure out the puzzle of how exactly we mediate, um, how we manage our emotional experiences. Here is one example of a study from um, 2004 um, from uh, Oxner and colleagues. 
who manipulated the level of emotional engagement and the valence of that um, emotion um, by specific instruction um, targeting um, either negative or neutral photos. Um, and the idea of this um, study is quite, um, quite simple. The design is quite simple. You look either at negative or neutral photos, but you manipulate the instructional um, cues that precede the presentation of such uh, images. Um, for instance, you might be able to uh, simply look at an image to decrease the emotional um, experience associated with it, its, its strength, its intensity, or increase it. Um, for instance, if you um, look at a neutral photo, that might simply be um, an image um, of a living room, so not something necessarily prompting a strong emotional reaction, but a negative picture might be uh, that of someone lying in a hospital bed. So um, if you are asked to increase the um, um, emotional experience, um, then you need to focus on potential negative outcomes of a, of a situation. Um, so let's say if we're looking at the picture of somebody lying in a hospital bed, um, you could imagine that um, that person um, underwent an unsuccessful surgery, that um, um, his or her life is in danger and he might not be able to survive for too long, that um, he's um, or her family um, currently experiences intense um, grief and so on and so forth. While in a decreased condition, uh, you might imagine that um, the surgery was successful, that the patient um, is healed, is cured, and might be able to leave the hospital very soon. And in the look condition, um, you don't necessarily need to turn up or turn down the emotional dial, but just look at the image and respond naturally. And after viewing and um, going through this um, manipulation um, as a function of instructional cue, um, at the end of, um, of that experience, you have to rate the uh, strength of the affect. So presumably um, that affect is going to be quite strong in the increased condition and um, the smallest in the decreased condition. So in, the, in virtue of self-report, we want to make sure that participants uh, have been successful in manipulating the strength of the intensity of the emotional um, experience. Then the participants relax for, um, for a few seconds and they continue on to the next trial. And, and the beauty of this um, type of paradigm is um, that stimuli always are the same. So irrespective of condition, participants view the same images. But the manipulation is not a function of the visual stimulus. Hence, you cannot ascribe differences in um, neural activity across different cortical regions because um, different stimuli have been presented. Rather, you ascribe that to different types of emotional experience as induced by uh, the type of instructions uh, participants listen to. And um, unsurprisingly, if you examine cortical regions um, that um, show sensitivity to um, emotional experience, um, you will find um, quite a lot of activation in prefrontal um, cortex in a lateral prefrontal cortex, in medial prefrontal uh, cortex, and this is not necessarily a surprise. So we see some overlap here with the default network. Um, and this is exactly what one might expect since we're engaging in a certain type of imagery. We envisage a potential um, situation uh, with respect to, um, to what um, the patient might, uh, might suffer. So if we imagine things, if we engage in any kind of mind wandering, in uh, contemplating uh, possibilities in, um, in the future, then areas such as the medial prefrontal cortex are expected to, to come into play. But so does the uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, the anterior cingulate, and naturally the OFC. So if you're contrasting increase or decrease in emotional experience, uh, you will see an entire array of, uh, of cortical regions. Um, okay then, so this is what happens. We see the involvement of the, of the prefrontal uh, cortex, an entire um, network of regions. But what about the amygdala? 
Um, and here's indeed the interesting part, because if you contrast the level of activity within the amygdala, um, when participants um, increase, when they turned up the um, emotional intensity um, in, for a negative um, stimuli, you see that um, amygdala activation is maximized. Um, it is significantly larger than what you see when participants just look at um, negative uh, um, images, images with a negative, with a potentially negative um, connotation, as well as neutral images. Um, furthermore, we also see that uh, whenever we turn down the emotional dial, um, the strength of the activation in the amygdala is significantly reduced relatively uh, to the look negative condition. Um, so what this shows is that amygdala signals emotional um, experiences, not just spontaneously. So we see how looking at negative images tends to elicit more uh, activation than looking at neutral images but also as a fact, uh, as, a, as a function of um, uh, emotional regulation, your own um, ability to, to control the strength of an emotion. And we see how um, the increased condition maximizes activity while the decreased condition uh, really dampens the level of activation within the amygdala. Okay, so what we conclude based on this is the amygdala is crucial um, in um, the neural mechanism for um, emotion processing. Does this also mean that the amygdala is involved in the actual control of, uh, of emotion? Not necessarily. The uh, current understanding in the field is that the OFC is primarily responsible for um, up-regulating or down-regulating the emotional content, but the amygdala reflects this quite reliably in virtue of its privileged anatomical um, and functional um, connection with the OFC. Okay, but now that uh, we reached the midpoint of the lecture, let's um, change gears and uh, move into a slightly different topic. Um, and this might account for why the study of emotion has had such a bad rep for such a long time in cognitive um, neuroscience. Um, from the point of view of somebody who studies decision making, emotion is not necessarily a good thing. And for the longest time, um, theorists of decision making have emphasized the need for a logical based, rational process to. Uh, uh, generating a, uh, a reasonable decision, a good decision, an optimal decision. So in this sense, um, emotion is seen as um, suboptimal, as something that corrupts uh, or biases the decision-making process in an unwanted uh, direction. More generally, people have, uh, have talked about a hot versus cool cognition in um, um, psychology to differentiate between um, reasoning and decision making which is not impacted uh, by emotion versus um, reasoning and uh, judgment that is um, subject to the uh, impact of different emotions. And just as a piece of trivia, um, this is uh, quite well um, illustrated by a uh, Pixar animated comedy in Inside Out, in which uh, one of the characters is moved into different directions by uh, different emotions. And um, um, the producers of the, of the movie called uh, upon Paul Ekman, whom I have uh, mentioned earlier, as well as some of his former students, for instance, um, American psychologist um, Dr. Keltner, who is one of the leading experts in happiness, to bring more um, realism into how different emotions can um, bias or can uh, direct reasoning and uh, decision making um, in the character. So again, this distinction between hot versus cool cognition um, has become quite popular both in psychology, in neuroscience, and more recently in um, pop culture. But to go back to the science, 
uh, part. One of the um, neuroscientists and neurologists uh, best known in the field for the contribution to the study of decision making and the role of emotion in cognition is Antonio Damasio, originally at the University of Iowa and more recently at the University of uh, Southern California. Um, and what Damasio suggested um, is that decision making and cognition more generally um, can be influenced by somatic states, by bodily states and our feelings about them, such as uh, nausea in disgust or a heightened um, heart rate in, um, in fear. And um, no matter how complex this hypothesis might be, uh, I believe it is intuitive enough. So if someone um, at some point told you to follow your gut when making a decision, uh, probably uh, that means that you should let that somatic state influence your decision. If you're going through an interview and um, your heart rate goes up right before um, uh, providing a response to the um, interviewer, then presumably you're letting um, that somatic state influence that decision. You're letting emotion come, uh, come into play. And you might be better off uh, pausing for a second and rather than trying to appear fast thinking, try to be more deliberate, more logical, more rational in um, how you approach a, uh, a question and in that way diminish the impact of um, somatic uh, markers, of those somatic states on, um, on the decision-making process. Um, however, um, Damasio went beyond simply um, pointing out what to many of us seems quite obvious, that um, cognition and decision-making in particular are impacted not just by thinking, by reasoning, by actual objective or what we think of it as objective knowledge, but also by this somatic or states or gut feelings. Um, he suggested that the OFC, also known as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, plays a key role in processing those um, somatic markers as related to um, recall memories, the imagining or thinking through hypothetical situations, and also, of course, as related to decision making. What Damasio suggested is that over time, through a uh, process of learning, different somatic states become associated with different um, emotions. So perhaps a uh, given um, bodily state um, associated with a positive outcome um, becomes associated with, uh, with happiness, while certain somatic state associated with a bad outcome becomes associated with a, with a feeling of uh, sadness. Um, so then the uh, association is between somatic states um, and activity within the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or the OFC. And we expect that if the OFC is damaged, not only would the um, decision making suffer um, since it will no longer um, be able to, to manage um, emotion properly, uh, but also um, this would be reflected in um, the somatic states. And a lot of the uh, support for this um, um, theory comes from uh, what's known as the Iowa gambling task. Um, on which um, Damasio was uh, one of the co-authors. And this has been, um, it's, a, it's a classical um, task in, um, in the study of decision-making and its um, neural basis um, for over um, 25 years. Um, it's been um, extensively applied um, and studied uh, both using simply behavioral means and also the neural correlates of, uh, of this task and of decision-making uh, that tries to simulate the um, circumstances of a uh, real world in a gambling situation. Um, the task requires in a lab setting um, that participants choose from a hundred cards um, across four different um, decks and try to earn the most uh, amount of money possible. Unbeknownst to the participants, Two of these decks are bad and two of these decks are good. Um, 
Summon decks are bad in that if you keep choosing, picking cards from, uh, from them, eventually you will end up losing money. While uh, the other decks are good in that if you choose, um, uh, if you continue to choose cards from them, over a longer period of time you will end up winning money. However, the incentive to choose a card from the back decks is um, that the gain associated uh, with a given card is higher than um, that from a uh, good card in the good deck. So let's say you pick a card from the bad deck um, and it's a successful card, uh, then you may end up winning $100, while um, from a good deck card, a good card um, might, uh, might only win you $50. Um, dollars. However, the losses are much higher in the bad deck um, relative to the good decks. Um, so, for instance, you might end up losing um, $1,250 if you choose a card from the back deck, while um, you might only lose $250 if you choose a bad card from the good decks. Um, so, over time, participants learn to associate um, these decks with the um, expected um, outcome. So um, they become aware of the fact that um, some of these um, decks are bad and some are, are good. The question is, what, um, what do participants with um, OFC damage um, do and how is this reflected in um, uh, some physiological markers of um, emotional processing? Well, if we look at the behavioral performance first, what we find, as expected in controls, is that um, at the beginning, um, the bad and the uh, good deck choices are relatively similar. But over time, as learning occurs, uh, controls tend to um, choose um, overwhelmingly cards from uh, from the good decks as opposed to the to the bad decks and uh, there's a sizable difference here in um, in those um, two different types of um, choices so learning occurs and um, you proceed with uh, making choices from the good decks in contrast if we look at um, patients with uh, OFC damage um, we see that overall there's not that much of a difference um, by the end of, uh, of the experiment, of an experimental session, we see about equal uh, amounts of uh, uh, trials with um, good versus bad deck um, choices. Okay, so um, if this is what we see at the level of behavior, what about um, skin conductance um, responses, which uh, we have seen um, already that are quite informative about physiological aspects of um, fear conditioning and fear processing. Well, we do expect, at least in um, normal controls, in healthy controls, that right before picking a card, the uh, skin conductance response should indicate a certain level of uh, stress or fear. And that is indeed what we see. And we see that uh, more uh, clearly for uh, the bad decks than the, uh, the good decks. So after a while, when participants have already learned that um, these are bad um, decks, um, they feel afraid, they feel anxious or stressed to, um, to pick a card from, uh, from these decks. And this is reflected in the uh, skin conductance response. In contrast, Surprisingly, we do not see any such reaction for uh, patients with um, OFC um, damage. Okay, what about uh, what happens after picking up a card? Um, and here, in the case of controls, we do not see much of a difference uh, if the card is good, and this is a form of reward, but we do see a sizable difference whenever the card is bad, hence we're looking at punishment um, trials. If the punishment occurs for a relatively um, small amount of uh, money from, uh, from the good deck, um, then we see a smaller um, skin conductance response than when losing quite a bit of money upon picking a bad card from the bad decks. And um, this um, certainly makes sense. We, uh, we see stress, we see anxiety, we see fear about the final outcome of, uh, of this game, of this task, um, reflected in the physiological state, in the somatic state of a um, um, normal participant. 
However, in the case of, um, uh, of uh, patients, we see no difference either for reward or for punishment. Uh, it seems clear that damage to the OFC uh, impairs not just the ability to make a, um, uh, an optimal decision, but also the um, ability to elicit the appropriate um, physiological somatic um, um, responses associated with potentially risky decisions. However, to make one point clear, it is not the case that these patients are not aware which ones are the good deck and which ones um, are the bad decks. Um, they, um, they are perfectly aware of that distinction and rationally they indicate that um, they should probably choose cards from the, from the good um, decks since that will maximize the uh, monetary outcome uh, over time. However, they cannot seem to stop themselves from uh, continuing to choose cards from the bad decks. In this sense, what we see here is a disconnect between rational cognition and evaluation, uh, decision making and emotion processing. And it is not just here. This is also um, widely encountered, let's say, in cases of um, addiction, gambling um, included. However, that goes uh, way beyond the scope of, uh, of the present uh, lecture. Suffice it to say that um, if individuals with OFC damage um, act um, in this manner in a lab um, task, such as the Iowa gambling task, um, you can only imagine what the real world um, reactions and behaviors and the outcomes are uh, for such uh, patients. Now, a particular type of um, decision making which has been um, extensively studied both in philosophy and in um, cognitive um, psychology is moral decision making and um, a lot of um, artificial dilemmas have been constructed initially by uh, philosophers to, to illustrate um, the difficulty of articulating clearly what is a right versus a wrong decision um, and perhaps none is more famous than the so, um, so-called trolley moral dilemma, um, which has been extensively debated in the, starting in the 60s and the 70s amongst um, ethicists and uh, moral philosophers. And one version of the trolley problem posits that um, we have this trolley out of control running on a track on high speed uh, which will presumably, if left uncontrolled, uh, run across uh, five individuals lying on a track and killing all of them. However, uh, let's say you happen to be by the side of the um, railroad and um, you might be in a position to pull a switch which will divert the trolley on a separate track on which a single individual lies. If you do so, then that individual will presumably die. And um, obviously, you have to make a choice. Do not pull the trigger, in which case um, five individuals die, or pull that um, trigger, that lever, and allow one individual to be, um, to be killed. What is right? What is wrong? What would you do? Uh, many individuals here, uh, many... Um, uh, participants in such a thought experiments um, choose to pull the lever and um, in that sense they go with uh, what in philosophy is known as an utilitarian approach. Um, they choose to maximize the number of lives that are being saved. However, a, a different version of the same problem posits that this time you are on top of a bridge. Um, along with um, somebody else, so let's say a relatively big individual. And if you throw that individual off the bridge in front of the trolley, then his body is, uh, is big enough that it might or it will definitely stop the, uh, the trolley from uh, killing those five people lying on top of the tracks. 
So by and large, this is a uh, very similar situation and uh, decision, at least from a logical standpoint. But if you think about it from a more emotional standpoint, this is quite different since um, you have to take direct physical action. You kill somebody by pushing that person off the bridge as opposed to just uh, flipping a switch or uh, pulling a, um, a lever. And this type of, uh, of problem is, um, has been extensively uh, discussed in the field um, um, for its um, real-world implications, especially as related to, to warfare. The ease with which somebody might simply um, click a button or pull a switch and launch a, uh, um, a missile that could um, end up um, killing many individuals, as opposed to being a uh, soldier in combat and um, taking um, somebody um, else's life uh, with, uh, with um, your uh, bare hands. So a lot of um, real world circumstances which have been debate debated for uh, um, decades in uh, philosophy, but more recently they have also drawn the attention of cognitive neuroscientists. And the um, trolley moral dilemma um, has been studied um, in this um, 2001 paper by Green and colleagues. And this was, uh, was published in um, Science, one of the highest uh, level, uh, highest impact um, journals um, across all scientific disciplines, not just neuroscience. Um, and what Green did in this study was um, essentially investigate how different um, parts of, uh, of the cortex um, react to different type of uh, choices, the different um, decision making processes, some of which may be um, quite um, um, emotional. So let's say the moral, personal type of uh, um, dilemma that involves throwing somebody off a bridge, some labeled as moral impersonal, um, let's say pulling the, the lever um, to save five individuals at the cost of one life, or non-moral decision making. In, in this case, um, um, choosing one bus versus another one um, while trying to go back home. Um, and what Green found was that, um, perhaps as expected, areas associated with emotion um, elicited much um, higher um, activity when recorded with um, fMRI in the context of moral uh, personal decisions. And you can see the sizable difference um, across an entire range of, uh, of uh, regions. Medial prefrontal gyrus, um, angular gyrus, uh, posterior singular gyrus, and so on and so forth. While areas associated with working memory tended to be more active in the case of uh, moral impersonal and non-moral um, decision making. Um, and in hindsight, this certainly makes, um, makes sense. Um, the more emotional an experience is, uh, as related to the uh, to decision making, certainly the, the higher the level of activity of areas associated with emotion should be. But what about patients with OFC um, damage? And this is quite, um, quite interesting. Uh, in 2007, um, this paper from uh, Antonio Damasio's lab um, show that um, if we ask um, individuals with um, OFC damage as well as brain injured controls and healthy controls, we do not see many differences in terms of the rate um, with which they make um, certain non-moral decisions as well as impersonal moral decisions. However, in the case of personal decisions, personal moral decisions such as throwing somebody off a bridge to, to stop a trolley, the incidence, uh, the rating, um, the number of uh, um, such decisions was significantly higher in OFC patients relative to the other control groups. And presumably this happens uh, because um, a healthy control or people with um, injury in other parts of their brain um, have to mediate. They have to, uh, uh, to find a, um, a solution that combines, that regulates um, emotion accordingly in the decision-making process. While OFC patients um, do not necessarily have to, to deal with the need of regulating emotion here, and they tend to um, 
uh, opt uh, relatively unimpaired, uh, unencumbered to uh, the utilitarian option, pushing somebody off the bridge. So now you might wonder uh, why this happens since OFC patients are also supposed to uh, uh, let their emotions run wild. But keep in mind that in the case of this moral dilemma, this is not something that impacts them directly. It is not as if they would be losing their own lives. Um, and it is not something that they feel right away, right? And this is not an electric shock that they would uh, react to. Rather, this is a hypothetical situation um, that um, concerns somebody else. So in this case, um, apparently because the OFC is not functioning properly, um, there is no um, appeal or reliance on emotion and the need of, uh, of a cortical region such as the OFC to take it into account uh, within the decision-making process. Hence, whatever we consider to be right or wrong uh, may depend largely also on emotion and um, damage to a particular uh, cortical area such as the OFC might certainly have an implication into um, our uh, concepts of morality and um, our real world um, decisions in the context of uh, moral decision making. Okay, but before we conclude, to finish on a somewhat lighter note, um, let's, um, let's take a quick look at a different type of um, decision making as, um, as related to monetary games and um, relying on what's called in um, exper uh, experimental economics the ultimatum game. Um, and this type of game would have you do is either accept or reject a monetary offer. A um, given individual can uh, make an offer to you and if you accept that offer they also gain an amount of money. In the case of a fair offer you gain five dollars um, and they can also gain five dollars. However for unfair offers they make more money whenever you accept um, a uh, suggested um, amount of, um, of money. So let's say um, they can offer you three dollars while they gain seven. Um, you uh, can gain two dollars while they earn eight. Or um, even worse for you, they uh, they can gain nine dollars while you only gain one. Um, and a common manipulation in this game is that the offer is also made by a stranger, by an individual, or by a computer. Now. If you're trying to optimize the amount of uh, money earned in this, uh, in this game, then presumably you should say yes to every single offer because something is better than nothing. But whenever a human makes you an unfair offer, especially if the um, level of unfairness is perceived to be very high, then you may simply choose to reject that offer. And this is indeed what happens in these such uh, um, experiments. So, for instance, in this study uh, published in um, 2003 by uh, Sanfrey and colleagues, um, participants um, were certainly uh, okay accepting fair offers and also accepting offers that were relatively unfair to them, but not by much. However, in the case of what they perceived to be really unfair, um, they were much more likely to accept the offer from a computer but not from a human. And again, this intuitively does make sense because uh, you may be less tempted to take things personally, to experience that sense of uh, injustice, of unfairness, um, if a computer is the negotiating partner on the other side of, uh, of the table. Okay, so this is something that um, economists um, have been studying for, um, for, quite, uh, for quite a while, um, ever since the 80s. But uh, more recently, um, neuroscientists um, have also uh, been quite interesting in seeing which uh, parts of the brain are particularly responsible or correlated with um, those unfairness-driven um, um, decisions. And one area that captured their um, attention was um, the insula. This is a fascinating piece of cortex, which is um, embedded actually underneath 
um, the uh, the surface of the cortex so you can see it here revealed um, upon trying to pull back uh, a piece of the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe and the reason this is so interesting here is because insula is known to play a role in the processing of um, emotions related to disgust so perhaps it is also something um, sensitive to the feelings of injustice um, and the impact of those emotions into the decision-making process. And that's exactly what Sanfi and colleagues did. They uh, ran this in an fMRI experiment um, in which a, uh, a partner is revealed, let's say Kelly, and Kelly can um, make you an offer to, to get two dollars while she, uh, she gets eight. And then you might make a decision whether accept or reject, and then the outcome is, of course, um, revealed. So what's interesting here is how the insula reacts to different um, scenarios, to different offers, and um, to whether the offer is made by a computer or by a, uh, presumably by a person. And what the authors found first is that um, the insula was uh, more active in the case of an unfair uh, offer from a person than, let's say, from a computer or um, um, when compared to a um, fair person or computer. And we can see that right here. Furthermore, they found that um, the insula increased in, um, in activity um, proportionally to the un perceived unfairness of the offer. So we can see how activity in the insula was maximized when Kelly um, offered you $1 while she made 9 how does this relate to the actual behavior? And here comes the even more interesting part of that study, in that uh, they found behavioral um, results to correlate with the level of uh, activation uh, within the uh, right anterior insula, shown here. Um, participants were more likely to um, um, accept um, an offer um, the lower the activity of the um, insula was. So this shows you how um, this part of, um, of the brain is responsible for mediating feelings of injustice, of unfairness, and probably also um, to their involvement in the decision-making process when emotion comes um, into play. Okay, so these are just some of, um, of the brain structures responsible for um, emotion processing and for um, decision making. Obviously, this is a much bigger topic of research that cuts across many different fields of study in and um, outside of um, um, neuroscience. And um, to us, from a practical standpoint, um, such questions are critical. So, for instance, uh, while well, today we saw how uh, patients with uh, OFC damage exhibit particular problematic symptoms in terms of uh, social behavior and decision making, it is not necessarily the case that uh, every patient exhibits those uh, behavior. As a matter of fact, damage to the anterior part of um, our cortex, to the prefrontal cortex, um, can elicit a widely divergent type of uh, outcome across um, individuals. There's a lot of individual variability um, in terms of how um, different parts of prefrontal cortex mediate behavior. And um, this is much more so here than, let's say, uh, when it comes to the occipital cortex or even to the parietal lobe. So in this sense, there is much yet to be um, uh, figured out when it comes to um, how emotion is processed, how decision making is impacted by emotion, and what the neural basis of, uh, of these processes um, is. This um, concludes the theoretical uh, portion of um, our lecture for today. However, uh, we do have one last element of a uh, journal um, article that uh, we haven't had the opportunity to uh, um, discuss um, to date. And this so happens to be the discussions section of an empirical uh, article. So the question here is, what does a, a discussion section typically contain and how should you approach it? 
Um, and one of the first things that you see in a discussion at the very beginning is an attempt to recap, to summarize the findings of the study. In many cases, this is a rephrased version of the abstract. What is more interesting, though, is what follows. And this is an attempt to place the key results of the study in the context of the bigger picture. Uh, the theories in the field and the ability of the results of this study um, to inform those theories, perhaps to uh, confirm them, perhaps to disprove them, perhaps to um, uh, bear out and um, suggest and prop up an entirely new hypothesis or, um, or theory. Equally important is a uh, list and brief discussion of limitations of a study. If the authors of, a, of a, a publication do not include that um, in their um, discussion section, uh, chances are that the editor or the reviewer, um, the reviewers responsible for evaluating that manuscript um, prior to publication, will make that a, um, um, uh, obvious. No study is perfect. Every single study has its own limitations. Hence, it is important to be honest and relatively thorough when um, acknowledging and describing those limitations. Now, if you happen to be a student interested in um, research, uh, one portion of the limitation section is also future directions or future um, questions to be addressed, because this um, essentially provides you with a roadmap for future work. So if you are a student uh, interested in taking up a thesis course, or um, if you are a um, later at a later stage, let's say a graduate student, those questions are particularly important. Um, cognitive neuroscience is a huge field, and when you look at how much has been studied already, uh, it becomes difficult to um, and even intimidating to try to find a new direction of um, research which can also be potentially rewarding in its uh, findings and outcomes. Hence, those future questions are particularly relevant in this case. And if a paper is being published, let's say, within the last two or three years, then certainly that is something to pay attention to. However, if you're looking at an older paper, let's say, published 10 years or um, even 20 years ago, chances are that um, those uh, future directions uh, are no longer up to date because other researchers in the field have already looked into those uh, um, specific issues. Okay, so um, this is a very brief account of the anatomy of a discussion. So then the question is, how should you approach the discussion? And the recommendation here is to never skip directly to the discussion before we, uh, you develop a clear understanding of the intro, the methods and the results. And there are many reasons for this. First of all, you're not going to be able to fully appreciate um, the uh, um, implication and the significance of the study as described by uh, the authors without um, having a good understanding of the prior uh, parts of, uh, of that study, the intro, the methods and the results. Furthermore, it is often the case that um, authors um, overemphasize or overestimate the significance of their fund for findings. Um, they may be overly optimistic or enthusiastic when um, um, explaining that significance and the implications of a study. There may be gaps or jumps in the reasoning, in the logic of um, how they, um, they move on from a set of results to the actual theory. Uh, and this is something that you have to pay particular attention and you're not going to be able to fully evaluate uh, or identify such gaps if you do not fully understand the, um, the intro, the methods and the results. Um, and this is certainly a skill that um, you learn to develop over the years. However, um, in the case of um, someone who just starts to, to read and appreciate the discussion section, uh, probably the most um, basic and useful thing that you can do is to apply the synthesis skill that you have previously applied to the introduction section. And um, that is attempting to condense ideas from a paragraph into just one or at most two core simple representative ideas. 
Um, and I would suggest that you um, sharpen this skill even further by um, applying it to the uh, beer paper, which has uh, already been used um, uh, a couple of times um, during this lecture. So look at, uh, um, look, let's say, three or four paragraphs in, uh, in this article and try to summarize those, um, those paragraphs into just one or two ideas each. Okay, so this uh, brings me to the end of the lecture for today. And um, I look forward to continuing our conversation next week uh, with a uh, um, twofold discussion of language um, and um, executive uh, control.